Genesis chapter 1. We are going to read Genesis chapter 1 and we want to read verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 6, and God said, let us make man, man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Verse 31, and God saw everything that he has made and behold, it was very good. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. So we have seen the two main characters in this story, and that is God himself and humanity. So we have been drawn into this story because we are part of that story. We are in the story. We are actually character in that story. Questions have been raised. Curiosity has been raised. Even though we have not encountered any key conflict yet, but we could feel that the groundwork is being laid for an introduction of conflict. I mean, these are various things that makes for a good story. We've touched a little bit on the nature of God, and we've also touched a little bit on the concept of the kingdom of God. But we are still going to explore more about the nature of God. We are still going to explore more about the concept of the kingdom. As this story unfolds, we are going to explore both of them in a deeper dimension, but we have touched on the nature of God and we have touched on the concept of the kingdom. We said when we look at Genesis, we see God who is Elohim, which is the name that is used for God in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, Elohim. We saw that what we see in Genesis chapter 1 is the revelation of God who is king. In Genesis, we see God who is ruling, who is king in, because history is his story. History is God's story. The story, as it begins to unfold, is set against the background of king and kingdom. As we go through this story, look out for kingdom vocabulary, look out for kingdom terminology, look out for kingdom language. And these are some of the things that sometimes we take for granted, and it is important for us to understand this. We've learned a couple of lessons with respect to God. We said when the Bible opened, God was already there. The Bible didn't try to explain God. When time starts, God already was there. And we saw that it is God, not Big Bang. It is God that created the universe. It is God that created the heavens and the earth, and that the way God did it is by the word of his mouth. And God created it without breaking sweat. God created it en -hil, en ex nihilo because God is God, because God is Elohim. God is mighty. God is almighty. So we saw that this creation marked the beginning of time, but at the beginning of time, when time began, God was already there. God has always been there. Again, like I said, as this goes on by the grace of God, we are going to look a little bit more into the nature of God. We are going to look a little bit more and a little bit deeper into the concept of the kingdom of God. So in Genesis chapter 1, we saw that God created the heavens and the earth in six days. So we have spent so much time looking at these six days that God created the heavens and the earth. And for the last couple of teachings, we've been spending time on day six, because on day six, God created the living creatures after their own kind. And also on day six, God created humanity in his own image and after his own likeness. God created man. God created the woman. God created humanity as the crown jewel of his creation. And God gave them dominion. God gave humanity dominion over the earth. So we've been exploring, exploring the meaning and the implication of humans being created in the image of God, particularly as this relates to the concept of the king and the concept of the kingdom. So we need to then ask ourselves, we've spent time on this first six day. The question then now is, so what happened on the seventh? So what happened on the seventh? So let's read, let's read Genesis chapter 1. We, we are going to read the last verse again. Remember, we've read it. But now we are going to flow into Genesis chapter 2, 
and we are going to read verses 1, 2, and 3. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. And God saw everything that he has made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus, chapter 2 now, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he has made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified because that it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So the question is, what happened on the seventh day? God rested. So we are going to look at the concept of the rest of God, what we call the Sabbath rest of God, the concept of Sabbath, the concept of the rest of God. You will see that the Sabbath rest of God corroborates what we have actually been learning so far. The Sabbath is not primarily about a day. The Sabbath is primarily about God, the God that is the king and about God and his kingdom. And that is one of the things you will realize. Oftentimes, we don't connect these dots. So this seventh day is not disconnected from the sixth day. This seventh day is not about the day, it's about God, about God who is king and this king that has been creating for these six days and then he rested on the seventh day. And that is what we want to look into. So, unfortunately, because of the way the Bible was divided into chapters and verses, Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 was separated from Genesis chapter 1. But actually, the creation story actually ended in Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. So we need to understand that the chapters and the verses were later addition to the Bible, and they do help us. So what we have seen here is that after six dramatic days of creation, the week of creation by God ended in this seventh day of rest. Okay, so there was this climatic, dramatic creation over six days. God creating this, God said, let it be, and it was. God said, let it be, and it was. And on the sixth day, God created all the living, living creation, actually from the fifth day, flowing into the sixth day. And then finally, on the sixth day, God gets his hand dirty, created the body of Adam, breathed into it, and man became a living soul. Later, we saw the way Eve was then brought out of Adam. So that is what we see. So I will say that again. So what we've seen so far is this sixth day of dramatic creation that culminates in the seventh day making one week. But this seventh day is the day that God rested. And this is the origin of biblical concept of Sabbath. So the Sabbath talks about God's rest. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more as we go on. You see, the, it's very important for us to mention it there because there are so, so many controversies with respect to the Sabbath day, you know. Is the Sabbath day the day of the Lord? Is Saturday or Sunday the Sabbath day? Is this a sin to worship on Sunday? Can we worship on any other day but apart from the Sabbath day? And there are so many, many other controversies that people bring about with respect to this Sabbath day. But the key to understanding the Sabbath, rest, as it relates to people, is to understand the Sabbath rest as it relates to the creation. I'll say that again. The key to understanding the Sabbath rest as it relates to us is not for us to fight each other. It's for us to go back to the creation and understand the Sabbath rest as it was instituted in creation, as it related to the God of creation. And that is what we are saying here. Now, let's read Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy man, man, man servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy strangers that is within thy gate, for in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Now, there are a couple of things that we, we see from this scripture that we read. 
right? That God himself rooted the concept of Sabbath in the creation. And God said, look, I'm asking you to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Why? Because of what happened in Genesis. For us to understand how the Sabbath relates to us, we need to understand first how it relates to God during the period of creation. And that will answer quite a number of the fighting and controversies that people bring about. Some people feel that if you don't worship on this particular day, you are not going to make heaven or you are going to hell, or you are not saved. We'll see whether that is true or not. But the most important thing, and I'm stressing it, I know I'm stressing it, we can see it straight away, that the Sabbath is not about the day. The Sabbath is about something that God is establishing. The Sabbath is about God himself. And we're going to see that as we move ahead. We must not read our contemporary understanding into this verse, just like we must not read our contemporary understanding into any verse of the Bible. Because, look, it is very tempting for us to read a passage like this and visualize God, who has been working so hard for six days, doing all this dramatic and monumental work of creation. It is tempting for us to look at that and think that, what the Bible is saying here in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, is that God has finally, you know, finished this monumental, dramatic work, and then God finally went on a well-deserved holiday where he relaxed, take a nap, so that he can regain his strength. Is that what the scripture is saying there? No. That type of, you know, understanding is wrong. God did not, and God does not need rest from his work. Why? Because we saw before that God created the world ex nihilo. In other words, God created the world without breaking sweat. Creating the world did not take anything away from God. God did not become tired. God did not become overwhelmed by creating the world. God did not reduce in strength or in wisdom by creating the world. God created it ex nihilo because God is God. So God did not need to take time off to recover from the stress and the strain of creating the world. No, that is not what that scripture is saying. Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 says, On the seventh day, God ended his work which he has made, and God rested. On the seventh day, from all his work which he has made. Why did God rest? God rested because his work of creation is completed. Because his work of creation is finished. The word there that is translated rested in the Hebrew is the same word that we call Sabbath or Shabbat. Shabbat. That is where we can get the word Sabbath. So that word rested, God Shabbat on the seventh day. God rested on the seventh day. But that word Shabbat actually means to cease, is to, 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 to cease, to stop. So what we are saying here is that when, when the Bible says that God rested on the seventh day, what he's saying is that God stopped from his work that he has been doing. Okay, He did not enter into a state of idleness or doing nothing. No, God did not stop doing something after the sixth day. What happened is that God stopped doing what he was doing before the seventh day. God stopped what he was doing, what he had been doing from day one to six, which was creating the heavens and the earth. God ceased from that work because that work was complete, and it was completed in the creation of the crown jewel of God's creation, humans. That was completed in the creation of human, and that was the reason why God rested. So the rest here... It's not a rest of, of God taking time off and saying, I'm tired, I'm, I need some rest, I need relaxation. No. So when he said God rested on the seventh day, what he was saying is that God ceased from doing that work which he was doing up until now. Why is that? Because that work is complete. Because that work is complete. And we are going to look a little bit more into this as we move forward by the grace of God. I know I've barely introduced this today, 
because this you will see that this actually have implication as we move the story forward as we move the story forward from creation into the fall into the law the calling of Abraham and all that we see in the old testament into the prophets and then into the new testament you will see that the concept of the rest of god is really really very important in fact let me go ahead of myself and let us read I'm just going to go ahead of myself very very much ahead of myself and I'm going to read this scripture in the book of Hebrews for us so that we can see that this concept of rest actually moved into the New Testament now I'm not going to be commenting on this I'm going to be doing that by the grace of God in other teaching but we can see the concept of rest moving pushing into the New Testament the Lord Jesus himself said that we should come unto him if and have rest okay okay he said if he, Come to me, all ye that labor and heaven laden, and I will give you rest. The Bible says, "I will give you rest." So Hebrews chapter four, verse one, verses three, four, five, then verses nine to eleven. Verse one: Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering war into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Verse three: For we which have believed do enter into rest into his Shabbat. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, which certain place is that is in the book of Genesis. Again, Hebrews is referring us back to the creation story, verse 4. For he spake in a certain place of the seven days on this wise. God did rest the seven days from all his work. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, verse 9, there remained therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that enter into his rest, he has also ceased from his own work, as God did from his, verse 11. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man shall fall after the same example of unbelief now. I have jump, 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 jump ahead of myself. But I just want you to see this concept. This concept of rest is very, very important. That is rooted in the creation story. You will see that that concept of rest is very pivotal. That concept of rest is a destination, a goal that we press into. He said, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. This world needs rest, but that rest is only, the true rest can only be found in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, like I said, I've jumped ahead of myself. We are looking at this concept of rest in the, you know, in the creation story. We've gone to Genesis chapter 1, We've, we've finished chapter 1, we have now moved into Genesis chapter 2, and we have seen that Genesis chapter 2 really, verses 1 and 3, is really the conclusion of the creation story. That is what we have seen so far. And that when we look at this word rest, we must not be, this, we must not be confused about this word rest. This word rest, when we look at the word that is used in the Hebrew Bible, for that word rest is Shabbat. And it's not talking about idleness. It's not talking about God being tired from his work of creation and then taking a well-deserved rest so that he can renew his strength physically and otherwise, no. God doesn't have a physical body anyway. No, that is not the concept here. The concept is stopping to do what he was doing before. In other words, when God entered into the seven, it did not enter into a state of idleness. No, it did not enter into a state of doing nothingness. No, it entered into a state of stopping what he was doing before, not because he was tired, but simply because that work was complete. And that is what was happening over there. And God rested on the seventh day. We are going to go a little bit more into the implication of this, the application of this. I've gone ahead into the New Testament to see that this concept of rest is pivotal, is foundational, is fundamental to what God is doing, what God is doing in creation, what God was doing in, in the Old Testament, 
you know, in the old covenant and what God is still doing in the new covenant. This is the exact thing that we are going to look a little bit more into today, but let me talk to you if you are listening to me. Look, listen, there is no rest anywhere. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labored and ever laid in. I've quoted it. He said, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Say, my yoke is easy, my body is light. He will give you rest. Rest for our soul. Rest for our mind. Hope that brings rest. When we see all the confusion that is going on, and there is so much confusion in the world today, the Bible says that the heart of men will fill them because of the fear of the things that will come upon, upon men. I mean, I don't know about you. Some of us, we don't know enough. That is why we are not afraid. Okay, economic-wise, you know, you know, educational-wise, and then we're talking about, you know, the world leaders, you know, we're talking about, you know, weapons of mass destruction. We're talking about wars. We, the, world, the world is in darkness. Darkness covered the sea. Darkness covered the whole world. But the Bible says that, the light of God will arise on those people that are his own. No, they, will, they, they, are, they are part of this world. We feel the pain. We feel the frustration. But there is a joy. There is a hope in our heart because there is a, a hope that Jesus gave to us. The hope that keeps us here, that makes us to, to hold our head up and to, to worship our king despite everything that is happening around us. And also the hope of that which the Lord will fulfill in us and through us in the future. So I want to talk to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. You can come to Jesus tonight, and you can receive him as your Lord and Savior. And then you will have that hope, that joy in your heart. The Lord Jesus said, my peace I give unto you, not as the world give, give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. And we are going to see how peace relates to rest. I'm going ahead of myself. He said, I give my peace on. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You come to him today. Go to him. Accept that you are a sinner. You are a rebel. Ask him to be your Lord and Savior. He will come in. He will take the heart of stone out of you and give you a new heart, a new spirit. He will fill you with your own spirit. He will walk with you through thick and thin as you pass through the valley of shadow of death. He will be there. And finally, when this is over, you will spend eternity with him, with eternal rest with him in the new heaven and new heart. Do it today. Tomorrow may be too late.